again, everybody. Good morning to everybody once again. And sometimes we edit the other part of the service out to show online and, and podcast and what have you. So I just wanted to, first of all, let you know my name. My name is Eric Gucci. I'm the lead pastor here. Thanks so much for being our guest here today. We also want to welcome everyone that's uh, at home or on the lake or skiing, <laughs> wherever you're located. Just want to let you know it's a lot better in here than it is there. So can you guys do me a big, big favor? Let everyone know that's watching at home and maybe that's watching in bed that it's better to get out of bed and get ahead. Come on. <laughs> I can do better than that. Let's welcome everyone here for the first time. Those who are watching online, nice and loud. Come on. There we go. <laughs> so glad you're here. And we like to have fun in church, everybody. And so uh, I just want to let you know what's going on. Listen, there's opportunities here to serve. We have, uh, we have a special kids um, series of meetings happening on. We used to call it crusade, but we don't call it crusades anymore because of the crusades in the Middle Ages. Uh, what do you want to call it? The kids extravaganza happening at the end of the summer. And if you'd like to get involved or, or serve here at Cornerstone Church, a great way to grow is to serve. We have growth track today at 1 o'clock. It goes from 1 to 2. We have uh, a, full, a full meal, buffet, child care. We even wash your car. Well, no, we don't do that. But uh, that's at 1 o'clock today. I'll be sharing Personally, I'd love to have lunch with you guys, share what Cornerstone believes, what we don't believe, uh, how you can become a part, and there's no pressure involved just to hang out, okay? That's what's going on. Well, today, I want to just uh, continue with our series on the Sermon on the Mount, but I want to share a story that I heard, a true story, about a young man that was taking violin for, for a number of, maybe over a year or so, and he became extraordinarily good. And they finally had an opportunity for him to perform in front of crowds of hundreds of people. And so the young man gets up there, and he's playing the violin beautifully, and he ends with a, like a 30-second note run, and then he goes to the high note, and the vibrato is beautiful, and it's an all-in-tune. And at the end of it, there was thunderous applause. People stood up. They were clapping. They were saying, bravo, bravo, which means, oh, wow, you know. So they're just, just having a great time and really a, a celebrating his talent and his ability. And the young man is up there on the stage, and there's a stagehand that's going to take him off the stage for the next person to perform. And he's crying, but he's not crying out of joy. He's like sobbing. He is so, like, distraught. And the stagehand says, what's the matter? Why, why are you crying? You, people love you. He goes, no, you don't understand. My teacher has his arms folded. He has not stood up. He has not clapped. He looks like he's not happy with me. And the reason was, is the player realized he had an audience of one. It didn't make a difference what Enwells thought. It was what his teacher thought. And he realized his teacher was not happy with him, and so nothing else mattered. Listen, everybody, we have an audience of one. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, really, it's not about everybody else. If you please God, you've done everything right. And so this young man understood that. There's something called a royal, you'll have a royal performance. So they'll have in England, and the queen will be there, and they'll, have all the, they'll do all the play, and the whole purpose of it is for the queen. And they, sometimes they'll wait, they don't, not anymore, but they'll wait until she claps, and then they clap. And it's all about, it's an audience of one. The problem is sometimes we try to play to the audience about it around us. We try to play to ourselves, and we want to be something, and we want to be seen and known, but God doesn't care. All that matters is the audience of one. The truth to be told, think about this for a moment, life is complicated. You want to complicate your life, try to please everybody. If you're a people pleaser, good luck. You're going to be anxiety. There's not enough medication on the planet to quell your anxiety when you try to try to please people. And life gets complicated. Let me tell you something right now. God simplifies your life. It's not complicated. It isn't. Sin's complicated. God's not complicated. He's profound. He's unsearchable. He's incredible. But if you love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, that's what he called us to do. When you love God with everything you have, you become everything you need to be. If you love God and he loves you back, then you can love your neighbor correctly. I'm just saying. So that's so important we understand that. And so an audience of one, and Jesus deals with this today on the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about giving and talk about how the right motives can change your heart. And having the right motives is very, very important. And so Jesus talks about that today. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. We finished chapter six, five. Excuse me. Now we're in chapter 6, and uh, it goes from 5, 6, and 7. An amazing, amazing uh, teachings of Jesus, which will completely wreck your world. 
because everything he said is so counterintuitive, yet it's the right way to go. And so we've been talking about that. And so we're talking about an audience of one. God wants us to live for an audience of one himself. And it just helps your life. I'm telling you right now, most complications, most arguments will cease. Most strife will cease when it's all about God and not you. You're so much better off. Now, the truth of the matter is, I struggle, maybe I'm the only one here today that struggle with mixed motives. I struggle with mixed motives. You guys are just so perfect. But I'm up here. This is like a 12-step program. I do. We've got to be honest, everybody. We all struggle with this to a certain degree, right? And so Jesus talks about this. We're going to read the scripture and go back and go line by line, okay? Here's Jesus speaking about this whole issue of giving. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you, says in certain translations, openly, says here, you. All right, so this is what we're looking at here today. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. I want to be known then you'll have your reward. You know, there was a, a number of years ago, I'm not going to tell who it is, but I was at a pastor's gathering with a bunch of churches, and what they do is they celebrate how much people give towards missions. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's not, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it almost became a competition. And so this church would give, they gave a million dollars, and this other, this other pastor of 10 people gave maybe like $3,000. And so they would celebrate these people, and they put them on a pedestal, give them awards, give them trips, golf trips. Uh, give them, I mean, it's got ridiculous. I'm like, what is, what's going on here? This doesn't seem right, you know? And, and it all became about what they were doing. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving money. There's nothing wrong with giving the missions. That's fantastic, and we should celebrate giving to other people. But it seemed like they were propelling people to do something more, that they wanted to be, um, they wanted to be liked. They wanted to be celebrated. And that's something that's what it's called to do. You see, it, we should have the right motives. We should have the right motives in giving. I, I heard of a pastor, uh, he was on uh, the office, his assistant was there, and some guy drives up to the church parking lot, knocks on the door, comes in, says, I want to see the head hog here. She says, excuse me? I want to see the head hog at this place. He says, who are you talking about? The pastor. You will not talk about our pastor being the head hog. That's disrespectful. He's a man of God. Well, I have $1.8 million that I want to donate. She goes, I think I hear the porker coming now. <laughs> Motivations change quickly, don't they? It deals with money. But we don't want to do stuff to be seen by other people. The truth is we want to be seen by other people. There is a longing in every human heart to be recognized. We do. We want to be recognized. And there's nothing wrong with that in the right context. But for followers of Jesus Christ, we should be different than the world. We should want to see God be glorified, not just ourselves. You see, Jesus says this. Let you, now, check this out. This is uh, so interesting. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to what? To be what? Seen. seen by them, for then you'll have your reward. Now, look at this other one. Let your light shine before men that they may? Okay, Jesus, which one is it? First, you're telling me, to do it so people may see my good works and glorify God, and now you're telling me not to do it. Which one is it? It all depends on the motive of the heart. Yeah. A little while ago, uh, maybe a couple, maybe a month and a half ago, we had an opportunity to give to Ukraine, and uh, I taught on this. I taught on that previous passage in five six. They may see your good works. I said the church needs to be know what we're for. They need to know we're for people. We're for people getting better. We're for making a difference in the community. And so if, this is the hard part, if Cornerstone Church, and I go, hey, yeah, what'd you do? Oh, we gave $50,000. What you did, by the way? Thank you. Okay. We gave $50,000 to Ukraine to give over 7,000 kids. You know, Cornerstone Church is a very giving church. I pastor an amazing group of people, and we're making a difference in the world, but it's all Jesus. Amen. It's all about 
You know, I can get that way. And by the way, if that was the motivation, thank God you got blessed by giving it, and the people in Ukraine got blessed, but God's like, I'm not impressed. And there's a fine line there. And, and so if, if, our, if our motivation is to say, oh, we're the best church around, we got the coolest church around, we're the best. We give the most away. All oh, those other churches are nothing. We are giving. If that's our attitude, then we've lost our blessing. But instead, if we do it, yes, we did it unto the Lord because God has blessed us to bless other people. That's part of the Abrahamic covenant. Be blessed to bless others. And if that's our heart to bless others, that God's pleased with that. And people can smell it, by the way. But if it's all about you, you see, it just, man, it's a fine line. Reminds me of the boy that won the award for being the most humble in the class. And he lost it because he wore the award. So that's kind of what happened. I thought that was funny. Okay. That they may see your good works and glorify the Father. I, I want to give glory back to God. And I hope you want to do the same. It's all about the motivations of the heart, everybody. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the inside. And see, I, I just want to give an illustration of two types of trees that you and I can climb in. Okay, I know we got monkeys we're worrying about, but we're not talking about those type of trees. It was a joke. Okay. So one tree would be this. One first tree would be the tree of influence. I want to climb this tree. This is the tree that, um, that Zacchaeus climbed. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a what? A wee little man, and a wee little man was he. That's nowhere in the Bible, by the way. Can you imagine going to heaven one day? Hey, hey, Zach, hey, Zach, hey, wee wee. Can you imagine that? Oh, relax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously, there's no such thing. They didn't call, he was a small guy. He was a tax collector, and he had had big parties. He invited Jesus to that party. But he was in a tree, and he decided to get out of that tree, the tree of influence. And many people in this world, including a lot of the church, we want to climb that tree of influence. Imagine if you climb it. And the higher you go in that tree, the more brittle the branches are, and the easier the break, and greater the fall. I want to climb, I want to be influenced. In fact, I was reading about, I was talking to somebody. I said, well, how does this pastor of this church that, you know, it's not that large, how does he have 5,000 people viewing his sermons? How does he do that? Oh, he paid $10,000 for that or something like that. What? Oh, yeah, you can buy influence. Really? Oh, sure. There's companies out there. You give them $10,000, and what they'll do, they have a, a mechanism to get people to watch your thing. Your, your likes go up, your views go up, and then they, they, they get on the algorithm, and then you can become famous and popular. That's what we want to do. There have been pastors that wrote books and spent church's money of $200,000 to buy all the books back so they'd be on the first, be on the on New York Times bestseller list. Stuff like that. Man, what's the deal with that, everybody, right? That's called the tree of influence. I want to be influential. I'm doing it for the glory of God. Yeah, really? By those methodologies? So you're going to buy influence? Well, I want to be an influencer on YouTube so I, I can just stay at home and make videos in my basement and live in a, six, live in a, a seven, seven figure salary. That's what I want to do, really. You know, and, and so there's a lot of this, I want to have influence. We call it influencers, right? I mean, that's. You know, some, some, some young lady in South Dakota that's putting on eyeliner is making a million dollars a year. It's like, what the deal is going on with that, right? And so they're called influencers. They want to be on YouTube or Instagram or, or uh, TikTok, and they want, to be, they want to influence, and that's what they want to do. I want to get more likes. And, and, and right now in our culture, everyone is, has a publicist. Everyone has a media department. Everyone wants to be somebody, it seems, right? I want to be famous. I want to be liked. How many likes did I get? Come on. You know you do it, too. You put something down. You put a quote down, a pithy quote, and you want to see how many like, oh, wow, I got a 200 today. Mm -hmm. and, and you start feeling that way, and you know something's wrong. And so it's a tree of influence. And that's what our world goes after. And the church goes after sometimes too. I remember there's been times where people would say to us, and we give into certain organizations, say, hey, well, Pastor, we really appreciate what you do. We want to fly you and your wife to Hawaii to go to our conference to hear about what we're doing. Who doesn't want to go to Hawaii? Unless you're afraid of flying. And so I can go to Hawaii and hear about how we can give more as a church. Because that, that way, I, hey, let's... Cornerstone give more, so I can, go more to, I can go to Hawaii more. You see how that works? By the way, this happens all the time. It does. Because we, we want to give, and, get, and, and let's be honest, people like to be known, they like to be liked, and they want to be, they want the tree of influence. But there's a different tree on the other side that God gives us to climb. Zacchaeus got out of the tree of influence and went into the tree of pleasing God. 
It doesn't make a difference what people think. I'm going to please God. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy today. It doesn't make a difference. I'm convinced that when we go to heaven one day, there are going to be un people that you never even realize. First of all, there'll be people in heaven, you're surprised they're there. What are you doing here? <laughs> Question is, what are you doing here? What happened to such and such? Oh, he's down there in the... I mean, there's going to be pastors. I mean, I'm saying, there's going to be people in hell that you never thought would be in hell and people in heaven that you never thought would be in heaven. The tree of pleasing God. That's the tree I want to be in, everybody. And you know what? You know how, you know how you can tell you're in that tree? If you do a good act and you do something that's good. Okay, let's suppose we... Oh, look, okay, we gave all this money to Ukraine, praise God, and I found another church across town, a less than a mile down the road, Let's suppose it's the, the White Oaks or something like that. And they, let's suppose they give a million dollars to Ukraine. There's news crews are there. There's helicopters flying around. What an amazing church. And I'm like, man, it's, they stole our idea. That was our idea. Now, if that's my attitude, the guy lost my blessing. But instead, if it's like, praise God, someone else is influenced to do that. Thank God that someone's helping the Ukrainians. Thank God that someone's helping the poor and the destitute. Thank God someone's reaching out. And so if someone does well and you celebrate with it, you have the right heart. How come they're getting all that? I should be in the worship. I've been there for 10 years, and this person's here six months, and they're singing a solo already. I'm going to go in the time machine. How many of you remember this? I grew up in the era in the church. It was kind of interesting. They used to have these overstuffed chairs on the stage. How many remember those days? These big overstuffed chairs on the stage, and all the pastors would sit up there. And then what happened during the offertory, there was a woman by the name of Sandy Patty. Everyone wanted to be Sandy Patty. And some young aspiring, this is before American Idol was out. They get up and they would sing some sort of solo. And it's got real high, you know. Behold the Lamb. And, and us, everyone would be like, ah. And it all became about the show during the offertory. Oh, I got in the offertory song. It's like, really? Is that what it's about? No, I want to be in the tree of pleasing God. And I, 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 I have mixed motives, and I suspect you do as well. Well, how do we get to that place? So this is what Jesus says. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is? Someone that puts on a mask. It comes from the Greek word for theater. It had an amphitheater. You'd be actors out there. It was all men actors, and they put different masks on, and they would act like something else. That's called a hypocrite. A hypocrite is not someone that struggles. If I'm trying to lose 15 pounds and I keep eating donuts, and I said I'm not going to eat donuts, and I keep eating donuts, I should call them do-nots, doesn't mean I'm a hypocrite. It means I have a self-control problem. Can someone pray for me? <laughs> but if I'm out here preaching to you about how evil do-nots are and how you need to take care of your body, and I said, I don't eat that. Meanwhile, I'm in my office stuffing down chocolate, double chocolate donuts, which I happen to like, by the way. If I do that, then what? I'm a hypocrite. Do you see the difference, everybody? Hypocrites pretending to be something you're not and trying to fool people. If you struggle with something, you struggle with something. So the Bible says... Uh, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and they would blow the trumpet. For example, there would be a time where someone would come to a, a, a village in the Middle East and said, come unto, come unto me, I got water. He who's thirsty, come to me. That's, they literally would do this. You'd bring water into the village. Come to me who are thirsty. That's where Jesus got that from, by the way. I found this out this past week. So they said, come unto me, those who are thirsty. People would run out, and the poor would come, and they would give water to them, and they would say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. It was a way to get accolades, to feel good about yourself, to be benevolent, to be liked in the community. Now, if you did it with the right motivations, that's great. So, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. If we do things to be seen by other people, we have our reward. We should do good works so people would glorify God. Okay, we'll talk about that in a few moments. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3.12, it talks about motivations. Here we go, all right? Now, if anyone, look at your neighbor, says you're anyone. Okay, now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, 
but only as one through the fire. Now, what's that all about? This is what he's talking about. The Apostle Paul talks about this. If I'm doing a motivation for being, if I, if I go on a mission trip to help the poor and help the destitute, and I'm doing it because I want to be seen, I want to get a scholarship to college, and I want people to think I'm this and the other, and I'm doing it to, to build, bolster my own way, and I do it for that reason, okay? That would be like building on hay, wood, and stubble. That burns in the fire. But if I do it, and I don't care about that, I just want to serve God, my motivation is to serve God, that's silver gold. So it goes through the fire. God, test it. God will test your heart. Why are you doing something? And I don't want to get to heaven one day and, and, and be here for over 20 years, and it was all about my ego, and I get into heaven, and, I'm, and God says, are you smell like smoke. Where's all your work? I don't, it was all about you, man. You were so insecure. All you had to do is receive from me. You would have been so much more secure. You kept comparing yourself to every other church. You, you kept feeling like you weren't good enough. I mean, you were high, you were low. Man, if you just would have done it for me only, you'd been so much better off. This is what God would have for us, everybody. You see, in Acts 5, 9, there was a situation at the same time. Uh, there was a guy named Barney, or Barnabas. He was called the son of encouragement. That's what you want to be called. You want to be called the son of encouragement. So if anyone ever, ever calls you a son of something else, say, hey, I'm a son of encouragement. You need to change how you talk about me. So Barnabas was a son of encouragement. He would encourage people. He sold all his land, or, or I'm sorry, sold a section of his land and wanted to help the poor. And so he brought it and he laid it at the disciples' feet. He said, here's the money. My wife and I sold it, and he did it for the right reason. And everyone knew about it. And there was this another couple, Ananias and Sapphira, like, wait a minute here. How can Barney get all that? That son of encouragement, we should do something about it. Tell you what we'll do. Why is he getting all that? We got some extra land. Let's just sell it. And let's bring it before the disciples' feet, and we'll just say that we, you know, we, we gave it all to them. So that's what they did. So here we go. Then Peter said, to her, and their husband comes, gives it to the Peter. Peter says, you're lying. And the man dropped dead. Then the wife came. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look at the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And she dropped dead. Oh, come on, pastor. What's wrong with that? Why would God do such a thing? That's not right. That's the God of the Old Testament. No, that's the God of the New Testament. Why would that happen for? I'll tell you the reason why, partially. Do you realize in that day the early church was so anointed, had so much of the power of God, that Peter would walk around somebody, and this, because he was so full of God, his, his shadow would heal people? They had signs and wonders. To, remember where you learned from Spider-Man? Too much power, much responsibility? They got that from the Bible. When God gives you a lot, he expects a lot from you. So the church had so great of an influence, so great of God's power, that you couldn't play with it. Listen, the higher you climb, the more dangerous it is you can fall. And if you're an electrician and you have a low voltage, if you're dealing with low voltage stuff, if you, you know, hurt yourself with a 9-volt battery, you have a little shock, no big deal. But if you're dealing with power lines and you make a mistake, you're dead. And so God is a responsible God. If you and I can't handle 9-volt battery charges, why is he going to give us a power line? Now, God loves everyone the same. But God loves you too much to give you too much responsibility to hurt yourself. And so there are people out there that really love God. And this early church was serious about God. Miracles were happening. In fact, I uh, went to seminary and my professor, Dr. Peter Prosser, told a story. He was an Anglican priest and he shared the story about how this man in the church, uh, his family's in there a long time, his, his mother died. And he said, we're going to give $10,000 to the church. And Okay, great, go ahead. But I want a plaque on the wall indicating that my mother died and I gave $10,000. He said, no, we're not going to do that. We don't do that here. What do you mean? Well, no, we don't do that here. You want to give it? You can give it. But we're not going to give that condition to anybody. That's between, that, we don't do that here. We don't reward that. Well, Peter goes, uh, Dr. Prosser goes on vacation for two weeks, comes back, and lo and behold, guess what's on the wall? That plaque. He was infuriated. What is going on here? He took it off. The man said, how dare you take that off of the church? I gave that money. That should be there. He says, I'm leaving the church, he told Peter, Dr. Prosser. He goes, yeah, okay. You'll be back feet first. <laughs> Two weeks later, a casket came into the church, and the man died. A pastor, what kind of God do you serve? That's the story he told. I believe he's, what he told was true. He said God was doing extraordinary things in that church. People were giving their lives to Christ. 
healings were taking place, amazing missions were taking place. He said we were going through a season where God's favor was on our church at a very high level. And let me tell you, everyone got fearful and said, I'm not gonna mess with that anymore. You got high, you got high voltage. For example, these two guys came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, uh, put us on your right-hand side. He said, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup I'm gonna drink? My friends, if you wanna be anointed to that, God still loves everybody. But the opportunity for blessing and the opportunity for influence in the kingdom of heaven is based upon a humble heart. You don't want to get to the point where you're so strong and so amazing and you don't have the character to back it up. And this is all about having the right heart, everybody. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly, it says. So what are three ways to give? One way to give is by be congratulated by man. I want to get to be recognized. I think we spent enough time talking about that. I think we know what that means. Another way is this, to be congratulated by yourself. Why does the Bible say, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing? Because imagine, suppose I give a million dollars to St. Jude Fountain Hospital or something like that, and I go, oh, thank you for doing it. Oh, no problem. It's all God. It's all God. It's all God. Pastor, you're so, I thank you. Thank you so much. I'm like, I'm awesome. I'm incredible. I'm such a good pastor. I'm such a benevolent person. I'm such an amazing person, but I don't tell anyone. I have self-pride. I'm puffing myself up inside. That's self That's like, that's, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. No, it's only by God's grace that I was able to do this, and I thank God for it. You see the difference, everybody? So don't be congratulated by self. This is what we want to be. Be congratulated by God. Amen. That's what we want to be able to see. That's the, that's, the, that's the element. That's what we want to see in our lives is to be congratulated by God. That's the whole purpose we're given. You know, I heard a story about Charles Spurgeon, great pastor, and his wife and them had a chicken coop in the backyard. It got pretty substantial. They made great eggs. A lot of you are getting chicken coops, by the way. Watch out for those foxes and possums. But that's beside the point. So she would sell her eggs. And so some family members came over and said, hey, uh, Mrs. Spurgeon, can we, can we have some free eggs? No, you need to buy them. You're so stingy. What's wrong with you? And they start talking bad about her. Well, she ended up passing away, and they found out the reason why she did not give the eggs away for free. She sold the eggs and gave them to two widows in the church that were going through a hard time. She didn't know, let her right hand know what her left hand was doing. Are we willing to lay go of all the applause of men and even ourselves and say, I'm unworthy, I'm only saved by God. God, I wanna give you all the glory. You know how refreshing that is to have people like that in the world? That's what God would have for us. I like what Oswald Chambers said, my worth to God in public is what I am in private. And that's really what it's all about. So there's a blessing in giving. I wanna conclude this time with this. And I, I, I really need to be uh, truthful with the word of God with you. So I'm gonna take a few moments to talk about this. Jesus says this, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I know that sounds nice in a fortune cookie, but what about real life? Is that really true? I'd rather receive. I don't know about you. No, it's true. When you've, have you ever given to somebody and no one knows about it? It just feels right. It feels like this is the one I'm supposed to be doing. Why? Because that's your design. Your design is to receive love and give love away without asking for something in return. That's called agape love. And when you do that, you are going back to your original design, how God's made you. So... What sorrow awaits you, teachers? This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? Where's the nice Jesus that doesn't ruffle any... Where is he? Well, I don't see him in the scriptures. For you are careful to tithe even on the tiniest income from your herb gardens. Imagine me going home and getting the, getting the garlic salt and tithing 10% to put on my bread and butter. Okay. That's what they would do. They would tithe on every little thing. Look what he says. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Here you are tithing on the smallest thing. And what does Jesus say about tithing? You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. That's what he's saying to us. So what is tithing? I gotta talk about this because I believe in this. I've lived my life by this. My family's lived their life by this. You can do what you want with it, but I gotta be true to what I believe God has told me to share with you. Okay, what is tithing? Tithing's 10%. You know 
You don't have to, but you get to. In fact, the Bible says this, Matthew 5, 17 and 20. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. For surely I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jotter or one tittle, one punctuation, by when no means pass from the law. I believe the Old Testament is the New Testament. That's the only early Bible. We believe that, unless Jesus changes it. So what is this all about? Well, in Amalekite, it says this quite clearly. It says this, will a man rob God? What did Jesus say? You should what? He said, you should tithe. So will a man rob God? Yet you, we've robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Again, this is not because so I can, this is not for the church. This is for you, everybody. This is for you. I'm telling you, it works. When you realize everything you have is God's, it's a great test. It's a great test. Can you imagine going to a restaurant? Well, I don't have time for that. Can you imagine going to a restaurant and all of a sudden the, the waiter comes out and they're eating your food? You're sitting there and you're, you're at Ruth Chris Steakhouse and they're eating your steak. They go, here you go. What are you doing? Well, this is what you can have left. I was kind of hungry. You'd sue them, right? Would you not sue them? Of course. You can't do that. That's your meal. Well, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Why? With your tithes and offerings. Everything belongs to God. He says, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now. The only place in the Bible that says try me is this. It says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Again, this is not about going to Europe on vacation. This is not by living in a big home. It's blessings is beyond material. Blessings is a state of mind. Blessings is having all that you need. I'm, I'm a rich... I remember um, Dave Young, who's home with the Lord now, told me on a Christmas, all his family was surrounding him. He says, I'm the richest man in the world. Because he had his family around him. He had his wife, Edith, around him. He's with the Lord in heaven now. I want to honor him. He's an honorable man. And that's what he said. I'm the richest man in the world. What else could I ask for? My family's here. Think about that, everybody. And, and the Bible says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And I, I'm telling you, when you're all about me, give me, give me, my name is Jimmy, you're going to be really living a horrible life. You need to, of course, when you give, you need to make sure you give them to a good place and they're, they're, they're accountable and all that. But it's important, everybody. It's something supernatural. I've seen it all my life, and I've seen it through the Bible. This happened even with Abraham tied to Melchizedek. This is before the law. For God so loved the world that he gave his very best first. It's about first. I don't give what's left over. I give what's first. The first thing that comes out of our checks, be, we tie it immediately. That's what we do. Now, it's up to you if you want to do it or not. But I'm just telling you, that's what the Word of God says. We've lived it. We've seen it. And God's blessed our family. God's blessed many people in our family. We're running out of time. I can't tell you more stories. But it's fantastic what God will do when you trust Him, everybody. And my God, Philippians 4.19, will supply every greed of yours. Is that what it says? And my God will supply every what? Need of yours according to His riches and graces. And this is all about giving, by the way, the passage here. So we believe in it. And so God loves a cheerful giver. But we have to give the, the right motives, everybody. That's important. You see, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You can't. For God so loved the world, he what? He gave. You see, you can be congratulated by man, the ways to give, congratulated by self, or be congratulated by God. I want to live in the tree of God not in the tree of influence. How about you? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you so much for today. Lord, I pray that we be a people that would be so full of you. God, I pray, Father God, I pray that this message today, I believe I've been honest and truthful with your word today. Father, we thank you that your, your word is not returned void. Lord, as we are entering a difficult season in our country and world, we thank you that your economy is different than the world's economy. I pray you'd meet every single need in this place in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that we'd have the right heart when we give. And all that we do, we would honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen.